Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Dr. Tony Campolo is one of the world's most engaging and thought-provoking Christian authors and preachers. He's appeared on numerous television programs such as Larry King Live and CNN News. He's worked to create and support programs for at-risk children in cities across North America and has established schools and universities in several developing countries. How often do you find yourself dwelling on your failings? It's easy to get caught up on all the ways that we fall short. When is the last time you stopped and considered all of the ways that people have been blessed through you? Join Tony as he shares on the importance of how God works through us. Here is Tony Campalo. You can turn to the eighth chapter of Romans because I'm going to be talking about what's in the eighth chapter of Romans. The passage is actually preceded by some verses in the seventh chapter that are really important. Paul is beating up on himself. Christians often beat up on themselves. He's dealing with the fact that he is a divided personality. Right at the end of the seventh chapter of Romans, he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, he says, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? I mean, he's really beating up on himself. He's really down on himself as he evaluates all the negative things about his personality, about all the things that are wrong, about all the ways that he fails to live up to the will of God. But then he goes on to say, listen to this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to go on condemning myself. I'm not going to go on putting myself down. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. I, I've been studying a little bit about this saint called Saint Ignatius who talks a great deal about the prayer of examine. It's a prayer that most of us as evangelicals never pray. Ignatius says at the end of a day, before you put your head down on the pillow, you should review the whole day, starting from when you woke up in the morning. Go through the day. Remember all the things you did that were good. Let me just say that again, that were good. All the ways in which you were a blessing to others in the name of Jesus. Consider the conversations that you had that helped people, the things that you did that encouraged people, the ways that you behaved that blessed people. Think on these things. Go through the day. Remember all the good things you have done, all the ways in which God used you to bless other people. The Apostle Paul advises us to do that. In the fourth chapter of Philippians, the eighth verse, he says, I'll tell you what to do, people. Listen to me, he says, whatsoever things are good, whatever you've done that was of good report, that people are talking about and saying he was a real blessing, whatever things you did that were honorable, whatever things you did that were a blessing, that were true, that were honest, that were beautiful, here's what he says, think on these things. When was the last time you reviewed the day, not in terms of the ways in which you failed God, but the ways in which God blessed other people through you. God wants to move through you. He wants to bless people through you. And he does it every day. And yes, you do have your shortcomings. You do have your failures. But the problem with most Christians is they dwell on all the failures, all the sins, all the things that went wrong, instead of doing what Paul says to do, 
thinking on those things that they did which were good and honest and blessing and wonderful to other people. We are called to stop beating up on ourselves and to recognize that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, we are divided selves. The psychologists say it's cognitive dissonance. That's a fancy word. When Paul says the things that I want to do, I, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing, oh, wretched man that I am, he's talking about cognitive dissonance as psychological terms would express it. What he means is quite simply this, that we're always torn within ourselves. There's always an inner conflict within ourselves. When I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, I remember students would come in and say, you know, Tony, I, I, I used to believe in God. I, I used to be like you. I, I used to believe in the Bible. And I, I trusted in Jesus, but I don't, I don't believe that anymore. I would immediately ask them, how long have you been having sex with your girlfriend? They would really come back at me with a degree of anger and say, wait a minute, I came in here to engage you in an intelligent conversation to see whether or not you had an intellectual apologetic that would make faith plausible. And I would always have to say, from Blaise Pascal, the greatest intellectual of the last thousand years, according to Einstein, up to the present, we all know that doubt does not come from intellectual reflection. Doubt, questioning, skepticism comes from disobeying God. It comes from disobedience. You see, it works like this. You grow up believing in God. You grow up believing in the teachings of Scripture. You know what is right. You know what God expects of you in the way of behavior. Then you begin to get involved, especially if you're young people. You begin to get involved sexually. And there's a cognitive dissonance. There's, a, there's tension between the behavior, which you know is contrary to the will of God on the one hand, and your commitment to God on the other. There's tension between the two. And you've got to resolve the tension. There are two ways of doing it. One, you can repent of the things that you ought not to be doing. You can turn away from your sin. You can, quote, unquote, repent and bring your behavior into conformity with God. That's one way of getting rid of the tension. The other way of getting rid of the tension is getting rid of God. If you get rid of God, then you can do whatever you please because there is no sense that you will be in a state of tension. I don't want you to do anything other than this. I want you to let the Holy Spirit invade you, possess you, come into your life. I want Christ to be in you tonight. And if Christ is in you tonight, you will be freed from condemnation. You will be freed from the doubt that comes from cognitive dissonance. Now let me tell you how it works in my life. There are many ways that people can experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. One is uh, uh, to come down the aisle and give your life to Christ. I've done that. There's something else, however. The Holy Spirit became very real to me when I began to pray differently. I used to pray like most people pray, you know, like my little boy prayed when he was seven years old. He came in one night and he said, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? <laughs> Don't you get the sense that sometimes when we're praying, we're just telling God a lot of stuff that we want. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. Give me this. Give me that. Lord, do this. Do this. Ordering God around. Please, I still make my request known to God. But I have to tell you this. Every morning, I get up, and I take about a half hour to center down on Jesus. There's an old African-American spiritual that goes like this. Woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, stayed on Jesus. And that's what I do. I wake up in the morning. I'm trying to urge you to do this. And center down on Jesus. Drive everything else out of your mind. It takes me about 10 to 15 minutes to become inwardly still. There's a difference between quiet and still. You can be in a very noisy room and be inwardly still. You can be in a very quiet room and be inwardly troubled. When I wake up in the morning, I have to become still. 
I have to drive back the animals. I have to get rid of the 101 things that come rushing into my mind the minute I wake up, the things from yesterday that are waiting to be done, the, the things that lie ahead in the days and the hours that stand before me. My mind starts bouncing around like a ping pong ball and I've got to stop and I've got to center down. And I say the name Jesus over and over again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because there's something about that name. When I'm totally centered on Jesus, when I've driven everything else out of my mind, in stillness and in quietude, I begin to feel the presence of Christ. I begin to sense the spirit of Christ flowing into me. I, I begin to sense myself absorbing Jesus and suddenly Jesus isn't just somebody I believe in. In that process of prayer, Jesus enters into me. He's no longer somebody who is with me. He is somebody who is in me. Jesus is with you. You believe in Jesus, but I've got to ask you a very simple question tonight. Is the Christ you believe in is the Christ you know who is with you ever invaded you? Have you ever opened yourself up and said, Christ Jesus, I not only want to believe in you, I want you to flow into me. I want you to be a presence. I want you to saturate my personality. When Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, he said, Father, I pray that I might be in them as you are in me. Even as Jesus was an incarnation of God the Father. So he wants you to be filled with him and become an incarnation of him. He wants to live in you. There's a big difference, people, between believing in Jesus, having Jesus with you, and having Christ in you. And in the morning, I center down. And when Christ comes in, oh, oh, the joy of that. He alleviates the pain and the ugliness of my life. There is therefore now no condemnation. When Christ is in me, you know what he does? He cleanses me. He takes away my sin. It's buried in the deepest sea. It's remembered no more. The apostle Paul says this. When the Holy Spirit is in you, you're able to do something incredible. Here it is. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, with the power of the Holy Spirit, you are able to forget those things which are behind and press on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. People, people, I'm asking you, has Christ come into you? Has he encouraged you to see the blessings that you have been. And Paul goes on in that fourth chapter of Philippians, and he says, after you think about all the ways that God cleanses you and delivers you and uses you to bless other people, he says this, the next verse, the ninth verse, and keep on doing these things. The Spirit of God wants to encourage you, wants to encourage you. You say, you don't know the things that are true about me. I guess I don't, and you don't know the things that are true about me. Every once in a while, somebody says to me, you're supposed to be a good Christian. I know non-Christians that are better than you are. Big deal. <laughs> if those people are so wonderful without Jesus, imagine how much more wonderful they would be with Jesus. And if you think I am so rotten with Jesus, can you imagine? <laughs> People, I am not what I am going to be. I'm on my way. I am not what I was. I am not what I'm going to be. But brothers and sisters, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. And that's the call of the gospel. When I was a boy, I remember... Uh, being in church on a communion Sunday, and it's Baptist church I belong to, and I was just a boy, and the minister was condemning people. Sometimes ministers do that. They just lay trips on people. And just before it was time to take the bread and take the cup, uh, he, he, he started laying it on. Anybody, says the scripture, who eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to his soul. Jeez. <laughs> and this poor woman in front of me, she looked like she was about 18 years old, started crying uncontrollably, crying and shaking. 
when the minister said, if you're unworthy of the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ, don't take it. Because if you don't take, if you take it unworthily, you will be doomed and burned and cheese. The plate of bread came towards her and this poor woman crying and shaking said, no, no, no. And my Italian father from Italy reached over and put his hand on her shoulder and squeezed it tightly and he said in his Italian accent, take it girl, take it girl, it was meant for you. It was meant for you. And that's the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ did not come into our lives to condemn us. He did not come into the world to condemn us, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? And so I'm here to tell you, what you need to do is take time to let Christ come in, the affirming Christ, the cleansing Christ, the purifying Christ, the Christ who will in fact help you to see yourself in a positive light. Beyond that, when the Holy Spirit comes in, you not only begin to get over the, the beating down of self that is so much a part of religion. Note I said religion, not Christianity. Religion gets people feeling guilty. Christ sets us free from guilt. And so I say this. He not only does that. He not only delivers us from condemnation. Are you ready for this next part? If you go on to that same 8th chapter of Romans, he says this. Listen. He says... I know you're weak and I'm weak. And in our weakness, we don't seem to be able to overcome certain temptations. For those of you who are young people who are sexually involved, you try to back off. You try to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I'm not going to get involved like this anymore. But the next time you're in the situation, you give in. And you're back in the same situation because here's what Paul says in this eighth chapter of Romans, because you're weak. But when the spirit of Christ is in you, what you could never do in your own strength, or as he says, in the flesh, you can do if the spirit is in you. Read it. That's what it says. The spirit will enable you to do it. When I was in high school, I played on the high school basketball team at West Philadelphia High. And in order to do that, the coach made us all go out for the, for the track team to get us in shape, you know, to run and develop our lungs and all that. And I, I wasn't very good, but I ran the mile. Anybody can run the mile if he doesn't mind vomiting at the end of the race. <laughs> and I was okay. I made the team and I ran the mile. Well, when, when I was... 16 years old, I remember it well. They, they took the whole track team to Franklin Field in Philadelphia to see the pen relays, and more important, to see the great Roger Bannister run the mile. Now, only the older people here will remember the name Roger Bannister, but if you're as old as I am, and that's pretty old, man. I mean, I've reached that age where my idea of a happy hour is a nap. <laughs> hey, you know you're old. You know you're old. When you go to a wedding and the bride's grandmother looks better than the bride, you know you're old. The bride comes down the aisle, you say, kids are getting married. The grandmother comes down the aisle, you say, foxy lady. You know, you know you're slip sliding away. The older people here will remember the name Roger Bannister because he was the first man to run the mile in less than four minutes. He was the first guy to break the four minute mile barrier. It was incredible. The second time he did it was at Franklin Field and I was there. And I watched him pull away from the pack. I watched him coming down the runway faster and faster, pulling away from the others, going at a breakneck speed. He crossed the finish line. And those who are as old as I am remember that whenever Roger Bannister Ran the mile, he so exhausted himself that when he crossed the finish line, he would collapse and fall to the ground unconscious. He did it. He broke the four-minute mile for the second time. He collapsed in a total exhaustion. Unconscious, he laid on the cinder track. They came out with a stretcher. They piled him on the stretcher. Everybody's cheering, and as they're carrying his guy out, he looks like he's dead. 
and my coach put his hand on my shoulder and he said, do you see that, Tony? I expect you to do that. Jeez. Listen, I love my high school, but if they thought I was gonna drop dead for old West Philadelphia High, they had another guest coming, man. Two things, when I saw them carrying Roger Bannister off half dead, I didn't want to do that. I had no desire to do that. I did not have the will to do it. But even if I had wanted to be the world's greatest miler, look at me, I'm not built for it. I'm not built to be a great miler. I lack both the will and the ability to do it. And so it is when it comes to living the life that you want to live for Christ. You do want to live for Christ, I know that about you. But the problem is your will isn't strong enough and even if it was strong enough, you wouldn't be able to pull it off anyway. But here's what the Bible says, listen to it carefully, when the Spirit is in you, the Spirit worketh in you, and I'm quoting from Scripture now, both to will and to do His good pleasure. You will want to do it. The desire to be Christ-like will grow and grow and grow and grow in intensity. The more the Spirit possesses you, the more you will want to be like Jesus. And not only that, the more the Spirit is in you, the more He will empower you to be like Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. See, Paul is filled with all kinds of good news here tonight. Don't condemn yourself. Don't worry about the fact that there are dark sides to your humanity. What Jesus wants you to do tonight when you go to bed is to think about all the ways in which you did the right thing, the blessed things, the way in which you were an instrument of his to do his will in the world. Think on these things, says Paul. And beyond that, let the Spirit in you not only to deliver you from self-condemnation, but to empower you, empower you to be more than conquerors in the days that lie ahead. That's the good news of the gospel. There's another thing. The same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, which comes to you in quietude and in stillness. I mean, I, I, I believe in praying publicly, but I don't like it. For a few years, I was a pastor of a church while I was in graduate school. I liked the preaching and I liked the pastoring. I just didn't like praying in public. And that's because basically I'm Baptist. You say, what's that got to do with it? Baptists are not allowed to write out their prayers and read them. If you're, if you're Anglican, you can do that. Presbyterian, Methodist, you can do that. Baptists have to close their eyes and make up the prayer as they go. I mean, if you're in a Baptist church and the guy reads his prayer, you'll see Biddy saying, he reads his prayers. Did you see that he reads his prayers? So you have to make them up. And let me tell you, people, it's really difficult to get intensely connected with Christ, lovingly connected with Christ, and be aware of what you're saying to people at the same time. Very difficult. And one time I was halfway through, a, through this service and I prayed and, you know, I really got into Jesus and forgot the congregation. And my street language from Philadelphia surfaced. <laughs> On the way out of church, some lady said, do you know how many grammatical errors you made in the prayer this morning? Before I could catch myself, I said, I wasn't talking to you anyway. Jesus says, look, if you really want to pray, go into the closet and shut the door where there are no distractions. Be still, be quiet. You all know those, those, that passage. In the 42nd chapter of Isaiah where it says, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles and fly. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Please note the progression. We always start off in the Christian life flying like eagles. After a while, we're just running like a deer, but eventually we wear out and we're just kind of making it and hope we don't faint. <laughs> but here's what the Bible says. If you wait upon the Lord, he will renew your strength. He will make you an eagle again. When was the last time you waited? When was the last time you gave God 10, 15 minutes of absolute stillness and in that quietude? Ask for nothing. Focused totally on Jesus and waited. 
waited for the Spirit of God to invade you, flow into you, saturate you. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And the next verse is even more incredible. And in quietude and in stillness, he will come into you. Be still, says the scripture, and know that I am God. People, you believe in Jesus. That's who comes to a thing like this, believers. But that doesn't mean that Christ is a living presence in you. That doesn't mean that Christ is somebody that you feel radiating in your being, stirring every nerve and sinew of your personhood. You don't feel, you say, oh, do you trust your feelings? Of course I do. I'm Italian. Man. I want to feel Jesus. I, I don't, I, as the old hymn goes, I, I ask no dream, no prophet's ecstasy, but I want him to invade, says the old hymn, and take the deadness of my soul away. Oh, spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. And I pray without saying anything. I just in quietude wait for the spirit to invade, to penetrate, to saturate, and he empowers me. He empowers me both to will and to do his good pleasure. But listen to this next thing. Check it out. Later on in the same chapter, he says, if the Spirit is in you, you will have a new understanding of who you are. You will be able to call God, listen to this, Abba. Now, your preacher has probably told you that the word Abba is the ancient Aramaic word for daddy. It's, it's incredible intimacy. And that was a break from the ancient world. In the ancient world, God was the fearful being who lived in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle on, on Mount Zion. And, and everybody trembled in the face of God, the fear of God. And all of a sudden, here comes, here comes the word. If the Spirit of God is in you, you won't be afraid of God anymore. Instead, you will be able to call him Abba. You will have this intimate relationship. You will sense this closeness with Christ. And you will be, listen to this next phrase, an heir of God and a joint heir together with Christ. I have a friend. He's one of the great preachers of the world. His name is Fred Craddock. He was on his vacation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. He was having breakfast with his wife, and they were having a delightful conversation. Went into the restaurant, came this old guy wearing overalls, he stopped at the table and looked at Fred and his wife, and he said, hey, you're not from around here. What's your name? Fred said, Fred Craddock, very abruptly, trying to communicate, I don't want to talk to you. Fred Craddock. The guy said, oh, what do you do? Oh, jeez. Fred said, I'm a professor of homiletics at a theological seminary. That ought to scare anybody. I mean, I know what it's like to say something like that and scare people. When I'm on airplanes and I don't want to talk because I have work to do, and the guy next to me says, hey, what do you do? If I want to talk, I say, I'm a sociologist, which I am. I say, oh, how interesting. If I really want to put the guy off and not be bothered by him, I simply say, I'm a Baptist evangelist. Ends the conversation. <laughs> Stops dead. It's over. It's done. I won't hear from him again. This guy said, I'm a professor of homiletics at a theological seminary. This old hillbilly guy said, hey, you're a preacher, aren't you? Oh, God. That's cutting right through it. He pulled up a chair and sat down. He said, I want to tell you a preacher story. Fred said, I could hardly wait. He pointed out the window. He said, you see those hills out there? I was born in those hills. And when I was growing up, you know what they called me? They called me Ben the Bastard Boy. And you know why they called me the Bastard Boy? Because that's what I am, mister. My mother would never tell me who my father was. Somebody in this town, but I don't know who it is. She would never tell me. When I went to school, they made fun of me. They called me Ben the Bastard Boy. I was afraid to go out at recess because they would mock me. Hey, Ben the Bastard Boy. When I was 12 years old, a new preacher came to this town. And everybody was talking about how wonderful he was. For the first time, I went to church just to hear this man. I went late and left early to make sure that nobody talked to me coming or going. He was good. 
He really was good, said the old man. One Sunday he was so good I forgot to get up and left. Left. I, I, I stayed and, and, and the service was over and people squeezed into the aisle and they, I couldn't get out and suddenly there was a heavy hand on my shoulder. I turned. This preacher man was staring down at me. And he said, hey boy, what, what's your name? And before I could answer, he asked me, who's your father, boy? Tell me, who's your father? Fred, the old man said, when he asked me who my father was, the pain went down to the bottom of my toes, shot to the top of my head. He asked me the one question I didn't want anybody to ask me. Who's your father? And then he said, you don't know who your father is, do you, boy? You don't even know his name, do you? He said, well, I do. I do know your father's name, and that's why I'm here. I want to tell you who your father is. The old man said, I looked up into that preacher's face, waiting to hear the answer to the riddle of my existence. And that preacher man said, boy, your father is God. That's your father. Your father's name is God. And boy, don't you ever forget. You are a child of God. The old man said, when he told me that God was my father, that I was a precious child of God, my whole understanding of myself changed. I suddenly realized my significance, my importance, my value. I, I got to tell you, preacher, when he told me that, it changed my whole life. Moved by the telling of his own story, he brushed away a tear from his cheek and got up and left. And as he walked away from the table, the waitress came over and said, do you know who you were talking to? Do you know who you were talking to? Fred said, I, I think he said his name was Ben. She said, that's Ben Hooper, the governor of Tennessee. A man who went on to greatness because he understood that in the eyes of God, he was great. People, you are great. When the Holy Spirit is in you, you can call the God, the transcendental deity who created the universe, you can call him Abba, Daddy. You can have an intimate fellowship with him when the Spirit of God is in you. I'm not talking about being a believer. I'm talking about surrendering and allowing the Spirit to saturate your being, flow into you. I want Christ to be a living presence in you. And then you can call. That's what it says in the 8th chapter of Romans. Then you can call him Abba, and you become an heir of God and a joint heir together with Christ. Do you know what that means? That means that everything that was in Christ will be in you. And I can't emphasize that enough. Let me tell you the most important thing that will happen. If that spirit of Christ is in you, and you become an heir of God and a joint heir together with Christ, all the emotions, all the feelings that Christ has, you will have. Your heart will be broken by the things that break the heart of Jesus. You will feel for those who are in need what Christ feels. You will weep over the things that Christ weeps over. You will feel towards others what Christ feels towards them. I head up a missionary organization. We have a lot of work down there in Haiti and in Zimbabwe and Dominican Republic. We run a network of 95 schools for slave children. There are a quarter of a million slave children in Haiti. They're called Restavex. They come from families that are so poor that their families give them away. And those who take them in reduce them to slavery. I was in a town called Lembe. And I was walking down the street with a pastor at, ne at Eventide. And I saw kids sleeping on the street. I asked about them. Oh, he said they're orphans. Their parents have died of AIDS. Nobody takes care of them. They live on the streets until they die. I shuddered at that. I said, how many of them are there in this town? He said, oh, I think one time I counted them up. There's about 40. We went back to his house, and we figured out how much money it would take to build a residence hall and a school, a place for them to be and cared for, fed, clothed, educated, the whole ball of wax. 
was a quarter of a million dollars U.S. So I, I came back to the States, and I want to say I went around and begged people for money. I begged everybody I knew. Within a month, I had the money. We went back to Haiti, and we built the place. We got the doctor in to, to be there for three months to take care of these kids, get rid of their worms and diseases. We, we had teachers come in. We had the whole thing set up for these 40 kids. The day we were to open the thing, the priest in Limbe put the word out, told the homeless children to come to the central plaza to be picked up, to be taken to this wonderful new home where they would be fed and clothed and housed and educated. We got on the bus and we went to the plaza. When I got there, there weren't 40 kids. There were almost 300. The word had gotten out to other villages. Homeless kids had come in hoping, hoping, hoping. Because the lifespan of a child who's orphaned and living on the streets doesn't go beyond 14 or 15. They knew that their life was hanging in the balance. When I drove up and I saw these 300 kids, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. But you know what I had to do? I had to pick out 40 kids. Out of that crowd of some 300 plus, I had to pick out 40. Hear me, people. It's impossible to pick out 40 kids to live without choosing 260 kids to die. I try not to look back on their faces, but I will always remember their faces. Uh, they're etched indelibly in my consciousness. I, I want to blot them out, but I can always close my eyes and see them. We got the 40 chosen ones on the bus. We got back to the residence hall, the little school that we had built. And as these children tumbled off the bus, there was a church choir there, and they were singing, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good to me. He loves me so. He loves me so. You know that song. And something within me screamed against God. And I could hear myself inwardly saying, you're not good. You don't care. If you were good and you cared, I wouldn't have left those kids back there to die. And I sensed God speaking to me and saying, I am good and I do care. And they will die. But not because I lack goodness and I am devoid of caring, but because those people who call themselves Christians, they my followers who say they, they are part of my kingdom, they, they don't really care. If they cared, they would do something about all of this. I felt Christ saying that to me. If you become an heir of God, says the 8th chapter of Romans, and a joint heir together with Christ, you will inherit his feelings. You will inherit his feelings and his caring and his concern. And, and you will do whatever you can to alleviate that kind of suffering and death. You say, hey, Campolo, I can't change the world. No, but you can change the world for one kid. When you leave here today, as you go out the door, there's going to be a table from Compassion International. I don't work for Compassion. They don't pay me to do this. But I know what they do. I support three kids through Compassion for 35 bucks a month, that's like $1.15 a day. And if you can't afford it, maybe you and a friend can get together and, and support it together, particularly young people. You can do that. $1.15 a day, that's 35 bucks a month. You can pull it off. And for that amount of money, you can clothe, you can educate, you can, you can evangelize, you can feed, you can, you can supply a kid's needs. Do it. When you leave here tonight, do it. It'll only take you a couple of minutes to fill out the little form. It takes no more than two minutes to do it. You can pick up the picture of the kid, the actual kid that you're going to support. You can pick up the picture, put it up on your refrigerator. So when your children or grandchildren come in you and they say, who's that pop up? You can say, I have a child you don't know about. 
besides that people. Don't you want a kid standing next to you on Judgment Day? I mean, when the Lord says, I was hungry, did you feed me? Naked, did you clothe me? Sick, did you care for me? Don't you, don't you want there to be a kid standing next to you? So you can hit him and say, Tom, Tom. <laughs> Because the Bible says that Jesus on that day will answer, if you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Please, don't tell me you love a Jesus you can't see if you can't love a needy kid who you can see. Please, if any man says that I love God and I don't love my neighbor, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let me just say this. The same Christ who died on the cross, the same Jesus who is alive in this room today, chooses to come to you through needy kids and say, I'm here. If you want to love me, love me here. It has to be that way, you know. If Jesus came in the fullness of his majesty and glory, it would overwhelm you. There would be nothing you could do for him. There's nothing you could do for Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. You can't do anything for him. So what Jesus does is he chooses to present himself to us to needy children, and say, here I am. Love me here. Love me here. Love me here. And if you don't love me here, you don't really love me. That's so important. Will you do that? On the way out, would you pick up a kid? Please do it. If you're an heir of God and a joint heir together with Christ, you will have the same feelings that Jesus has. The last thing I want to say is this. If the Holy Spirit is in you, you will want to live out. Check it out in this eighth chapter of Romans. When, you, when it's over tonight, get out a Bible and read the whole eighth chapter of Romans. You'll see all the things that I'm telling you are there. Here's what it says. That when you were born, you were predestined to do something wonderful for God. He has plans for you. Plans that he predestined. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to do it. I mean, I... I I never bought into that predestination mindset that it was somewhat fatalistic so that, you know, everything predestines, you know, so that when you fall down a flight of steps, you thank God it's over with, you know, Jesus. <laughs> I do know this, that the day you were born, God had a plan for you. I love the first of the four spiritual laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. Let me say this. God has predestined before you were ever born. He had an image, a destiny, all carved out for you. And the question is, are you going to live out the destiny that God has prescribed for you, or are you going to live according to your own inclinations? That's a good question. Are you going to be the person that Jesus wants you to become, that Jesus wants you to be? Heavy. Heavy, heavy stuff. You say, how do I discover what God wants me to do? What God wants me to be? That's easy. You should become involved in ministry to people who are in need right now. I mean, not just give money. I want you to support a kid. Please, don't go cheap on that one. But I want you also to give yourself, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, says the Apostle Paul, by the mercies of God that you present yourselves as living Sacrifice is holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. When you're involved in ministry, you change. When you're involved in ministry, you sense God's presence. You sense God's leading. When you're involved in ministry, the Holy Spirit within you enables you to discern what it is you ought to be doing with your life. I always invite young people to come and work with us in the cities across North America. Actually, we have two programs here in Canada, one in Vancouver and one in Toronto. They're called Urban Promise. I believe they have a display here. I would love for you young people to give me your name and address either tonight or hunt me up at, when I do one of my morning seminars or go to the Urban Promise table or give your name and address to your prayer leader if you go to a prayer time today. You know, some of you will be going to prayer time with some leaders. Give your name and address to them and they'll pass it on to me. I want to recruit you. 
I really want to recruit you to at least give a summer. We'd love to have you for a whole year, but if you can just give us a summer. You say, I'm in the university and I need money. I've got to go to work. Of course you do. We'll get the money. We'll write a guilt letter to your home church. We'll say, Charlie is here working with immigrants from Cambodia uh, there in Vancouver, working with the poor and the needy in government housing. I know you bought a new organ and a new carpet and new hymn books. But if there's anything left over for ministry to needy people, You say, are you a guilt manipulator? Of course not. I would rather they give out of love. But if they won't do it out of love, I go for the guilt. We'll raise the money because you being there is important. Not just because those people need you. We need help in these cities. We need help in Vancouver. We need help in Toronto. We need help in Camden, New Jersey. We need help in these cities where we are at work. We need help. We need young men and young women who are willing to say, here I am, Lord, take me, use me. I want to I make a difference. I want to I touch boys and girls for Christ. I want to love kids into the kingdom. I, I want to make a difference. We want you to come on board. So give me your name. Give your, your prayer leader your name. Give, cut me up at one of the seminars in the morning. Give me your name and address. Go to the booth with, with Urban Promise. But, but let's sign up because this is what will happen. As you work with those kids, as you work with those teenagers, as you serve Jesus Christ, you yourself will sense what God wants you to be and do. I was in, at the University of Manchester as a guest lecturer. That's Manchester, England. And, and, and uh, after I finished lecturing on the urban crisis in America, two students came up and said, a doctor, we'd love to come and work with you in, in Philadelphia and in Camden, New Jersey. Could we join your missionary work? I said, certainly, we'd be thrilled to have you. They said, we need to tell you one more thing. Neither of us believe in God. Can we still be missionaries? I thought a brief moment and I knew the answer. I said, sure, but here's the thing. You gotta fake it. All summer long, you gotta go to the Bible studies, you gotta teach children Bible stories, you gotta pray with people, you gotta sing the songs, you got to do all the things that a zealous Christian would do. Fake it. Fake it. Are you willing to fake it? The kid said, sure, we'll fake it. No, that's no sweat. <laughs> they came and they spent the summer with us. I need not tell you how the story ended. By the end of the summer, both of them had become zealous Christians, and both of them are Anglican priests in England today. I mean, that is what happens. Please. I'm so sick and tired of young people saying, I'm waiting for God to show me. Come on. What do you think he's going to do? Write it in the sky? Harry, go to Vancouver and work for... Do you think that's going to happen? Just do it, baby. And in the midst of what you're doing, Christ will make clear to you how you should be spending your life. Start with giving us a, a summer. Maybe even give us a year. If you want to give a year, put year on your piece of paper. And we'll work it out. Hear me, people. You will change in process. Sociologists like me, we have a word for it. If you've got to be a sociology major in the university, get this word. It's called praxis. Whereas Socrates and Plato said, what we think and what we feel determines what we do. The Marxist said, what we do controls what we think and what we feel. Both are right. That in reality, there is a dialectic, as we say in sociology that what we do does condition how we feel and how we think. What we do changes us. It alters our emotions. I have a friend, he's a great author, Walter Wangren. He writes brilliant novels. He once was a Lutheran pastor. He served a church in southern Indiana. There was a man in his church that he didn't like. You wouldn't like him either. He was a singularly unattractive man. He was hunchbacked. He had a disfigured face with a huge lower lip. He smoked incessantly, and the cigarette kind of hung on his lip. He'd walk around like this. He never bathed. He gave off a horrendous odor. Worse than that, he always came to church late. Worse than that, he never sat in the same place. So every Sunday, 
Everybody waited. <laughs> Whoever he sat with, he would talk to incessantly and wouldn't let them listen to the sermon. Walter was not upset when one Sunday, Arthur Forbes did not show up at church. In the middle of the week, the phone rang in his home and the voice at the other end said, do you still make hospital calls? I'm sick. Walter said, I went to this house. It was a shack on the side of a hill. The paint had long ago peeled off the sides of the house. There was a broken refrigerator on the front porch. There was junk all over the yard. The grass had grown about two feet high. I got to the door. I knocked on the door, and the gruff voice inside said, Come in! I stepped in. And there was Arthur Forbes sitting in this stuffed chair where half of the stuffing was hanging out of the chair, and around the room were piles of paper and magazines covered with a thick coat of dust, and, and the window shades were pulled down, and these green window shades with light creeping around the edges of them I went to Arthur Forbes and said, I brought you Holy Communion. Arthur said, forget it, just pray. Walter prayed with him. After that, he would visit Arthur Forbes regularly. Every time he got near the old shack, he looked in on the man. He did things for Arthur Forbes. He washed the dishes, he cleaned up the place, he would cook meals for him. And this went on day after day after day as this man deteriorated in health. One day, he knocked on the door, and when he was invited in, there was Arthur Forbes sitting in that stuffed chair, stark naked. Walter said it was as repulsive a scene as you've ever seen. This bony body with his yellowy skin, fat tummy. Arthur said, I was hot. And I want Holy Communion. Walter said, my hand trembled as I gave him the bread and I gave him the wine. I trembled with anger. Two days later, as I stopped by to see him again, nobody answered. I pushed open the door and there was Arthur Forbes lying on the floor. He had had a stroke. I contacted the hospital. They sent over the ambulance. Before the ambulance got there, I got Arthur Forbes up and with a scrub brush, I scrubbed his dirty, filthy, stinking body. Tony, he said, I had to scrub him in unspeakable places. And I dressed him, and I got him to the hospital, and I put him into the bed. I said, is there anything I can do for you, Arthur? He said, give me a drink. He said, I gave him a drink of water. And then he said, instinctively, I bent over and kissed Arthur Forbes on the forehead. I was stunned that I did that, shocked by my own action. I went home. I was in the study. The phone rang. It was the hospital. And the voice at the other end said, Arthur Forbes is dead. Walter said, when they told me that Arthur Forbes was dead, I started to cry. I hadn't cried when my own father died, and I was crying. And my crying turned into wailing. And my wailing turned into screaming. And I cried. And I wailed. And I screamed. And I pounded the desk, and I knew. I knew that I loved Arthur Forbes. He had seduced me into loving him, not by anything he did for me, but allowing me, day after day, to do loving things for him. When we do loving things, we may be helping people, but even more important, we ourselves are changed by what we do. That's why I say to every young person here, if you think, that you can become spiritual without becoming involved in ministry. You're kidding yourself. You've got to be involved because it's in the involvement with those who are in need that you begin to sense what God wants you to do with your life and where he wants you to go. A young man at Eastern University where I teach, I teach at this Christian university. It's a wonderful, wonderful school with about 2,000 students and it's 
the students are brilliant, the faculty's ingenious, and, and I gotta tell you, it's a great place for me. Many of my students have gone out to do Christian ministry. Only 3% of the students coming into Eastern ever plan to go into church vocations. 18% of those who graduate become missionaries. We really do a job on them. <laughs> One of the young men is with a team in, in the Kensington section of Philadelphia. He's written a book. Uh, one of the guys, uh, uh, Shane Claiborne, uh, the book is called The Irresistible Revolution. It's a wonderful book. Get it. But, but, but i got to tell you this. One of the young men who works along with Shane and others in Philadelphia on the sleet, streets was dragged into his, my office by his father who shoved him into a chair and said, yelled at me and said, you got him into this. You got him into this. I mean, he got a good education. And look at him. He's out there on the street with pimps and whores and drug pushers talking about Jesus, giving away money, feeding hungry people, taking care of homeless people. You got him into all of this. And then he said this. He said, don't get me wrong, Camp Polo. I don't mind being Christian up to a point. And he stopped. People, isn't that the way it is with each of us? Isn't that the way it is with you? You don't mind being Christian what? Up to a point. And you know tonight, Jesus is calling you to move beyond that point. To go all the way and say, here I am, Lord. I present myself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Holy Spirit of Jesus, I want you in me. I want to be filled with your presence. I want to be led by you into service. I, I want to feel what you feel. I want to have that new identity wherein I can call you Abba, Father. I want to be delivered from that beating down of, of condemnation. I want to be freed and filled with joy and ecstasy about life. I want my life to mean something. It's invitation time. Don't close your eyes or bow your heads yet. I'm simply asking you this question. Isn't it time that you made a commitment to Christ? I don't mean just believing in him. Isn't it time that you say... Lord, I've always believed in you. I've even prayed to you. But I've never surrendered to you like I'm going to surrender to you now. When I come down this day, I'm going to say to you as best as I know how, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. Spirit of the living God. I believe in you, but I'm pledging tonight to take time each morning to be still and to allow the Spirit to invade me. I'm going to learn how to center down on Christ. I'm going to be open. I just don't want to believe in Jesus. I want Christ to be a living presence in me. And I'm ready to go where he leads me and to be what he wants me to be. I'm a believer, but I'm not a disciple. Tonight I become a disciple. Jesus never said, go into all the world and make believers out of everyone. He said, go into all the world and make disciples out of everyone. And tonight, I'm calling you to move beyond believing. I don't want you just to be a believer. That's no big deal. Satan, says the scripture, believes. He's theologically orthodox. He believes the Bible from cover to cover. Please, people, believing won't pull it off. You've got to surrender and allow Christ to come in and deliver you from condemnation, self doubt. You've got to let Christ come in and allow you to call God Abba, uh, to get this new identity, to become an heir of Christ and feel for those who are in need what Christ feels. You need to let Christ come in and lead you for the eighth chapter of Romans says as many as are led by the Spirit as they live out their lives in service, they are the children of God. You're not a child of God until you're committed to, to doing what Christ wants you to do what he, according to the scripture, predestined plan for you to do before you were even born. And now it's time. Would you blow your mind free of all extraneous thoughts and think of Jesus and close your eyes and bow your head. And I'm asking you a simple question. You believe in Christ. You've been a Christian up to a point. 
but the Spirit of God is here tonight. He's always with us, but tonight you're going to say, Christ, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I'm surrendering, and I want you to come into me, into my heart, into my life, into my mind. Saturate me with your presence. Cleanse me. Transform me. Use me. It begins with little things like supporting a child, but it goes on to great things. He says, if you're willing to take the first steps tonight, if you're willing to be faithful in little things, it will lead to great things. So as we close out this meeting, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Will you raise your hand right now and say, I'm a believer. I'm crossing a line tonight. I'm going to become a disciple. I want the Spirit of God radiating in my being. I want the Holy Spirit alive in me. I want to be led and used by the Spirit of God. Would you raise your hand right now? God bless you. Yes, there are many, 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 many people. You may put them down. We all want it. That deep walk with Christ. That very, very deep walk with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand at this point, if you would. Are you ready to say, this is the night I surrender without reservation? I can't see you out there because these lights are in my eyes. I'm calling upon you for total surrender to Christ. I'm asking you to make a commitment to go to a quiet place each day and be still and let Christ invade you. Every day you need to do it because those who wait upon the Lord, they are the ones that will have the strength to live out this wonderful life I've been talking about. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.